Well, after a 24% rally in the NASDAQ and a 19% rally in the S&P, we are finding a few sellers coming in. There's doubt creeping into some of these risk positions. The Australian dollar, the Kiwi dollar under pressure. We've got copper looking a little bit more vulnerable. We've got bond yields moving up across the world at the moment. As you can see here, we do have an action-packed show today. There's a lot to get through. But the question we're asking, are the tides of change upon us? Blake and I discuss all those factors in the trade-off. Well, hi there. My name is Chris Weston. I'm head of research here at Pepstone, and I'm going to be joined in two seconds by Blake Morrow, Blake Morrow from Forex Analytics. And as always, we're going to be navigating and dissecting all the financial markets, as you can see here. As I said before, we have a huge amount of stuff to get through today. Lots of fair facets of the financial markets that we go to. So I'm going to bring Blake into the program. Blake, mate, how are you doing? Like last week, I just want to pull you up on this one. I'll pull you up. I'll pull myself up. You called the dollar very, very well indeed. If you'd listened to Blake's calls, I think you pretty much sold the dollar, euro dollar at the highs of the market, which is fantastic to see. So listen to listen to Blake. He's the man on fire at the moment. He's calling all the shots. So yeah, well done on, on, on some of those calls. But I think it's quite interesting, Thank Blake. Thank How are you feeling? We've got, a, we've got a lot to talk in the show, but we're talking on F. You, you've turned a bit bearish on the market. I'm feeling the downside's kicking in, but you're a little bit more bearish and pessimistic on that situation than I am, right? I am. And, you know, last week, Chris, we we discussed like, you know, should we be selling the, a rally in the equity markets? And I am starting, well, I'm already starting to get there. I'm already there. And I'm actually starting to get more bearish as, the, you know, that we've extended this rally and, and, and I don't really see anything's changed a yeah. whole lot other than a, a summer squeeze. A summer, summer squeeze. squeeze. Well, I think you're the only person left in these markets. I have some volumes in stuff like Bed Bath and Beyond are absolutely ridiculous at the moment. Yeah, so I saw a student yesterday or the newspaper saying that they, the one student made $110 million from trading that. But apart from that, volumes are drying up, and I think everyone else is on holiday except the Morrow family at the moment. Anyway, we've got a lot to discuss, and we're going to be focused on a lot of those calls that we're talking about. So let's go into Topical Funder and actually look at some of the thematics making news. We're going to talk about equities in a second, as you can see here on the uh, on the right hand side, Blake. But uh, one of the factors we're talking about now is the rates market and 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 yeah, central bank policy. We've seen a, a weaker CPI number, certainly on headline, sticky inflation. You have know, core at five point nine percent PPI has been coming down, and it's taken some wind out of the sails. But there are some reasons to believe the reflation, uh, the the the. Um, uh, the the, uh, the recession trade has been pushed right out. Um, you know, certainly the retail sales last night were pretty good. Yeah, the employment market is still very strong. Um, and yeah, people are just looking at the minutes and saying, well, were they, were they hawkish? Were they neutral relative to expectations? Were they more dovish? Certainly we've been seeing some buyers in two-year treasuries. Um, but at the same time, what we've also seen is the terminal rates. If you go into May Fed funds, you know, it's pushed up to 3.7% 3, 3 or 370 basis points. So it's difficult to say. Obviously, we've got Jackson Hole next week. Um, you know, I think, I think Powell's going to be on purposely uh, vague and give himself enough optionality for that September meeting. Um, but where do you sit now? Now. I mean, is the, has the market priced in the worst or, or could we see another re-evaluation of, of bond yields, which again could push the dollar higher and, and equity markets lower? Well, I, you know, Chris, I think it, it is really, really a key point that you're talking about that we have our interim Fed meeting at Jackson Hole next week. Uh, I, I do I do agree with you. I think the Fed uh, Fed uh, chair is going to be somewhat vague, yeah. but I think all the Fed governors out there are going to remain hawkish. And, and I yep. think the market does believe that the Fed is not going to let off um, mm. the, the the pedal. Yeah. And and uh, it's interesting because the markets have climbed and recovered so much that I think that that hawkish rhetoric that we get not only next week, but also in the September meeting is going to really suggest the Fed is going to stay its course. Yeah. I mean, they are they are still, I believe, behind the curve. I think the market still can sustain right now, showing with retail sales, as you pointed out, the jobs market is still strong, at least right now, that they can continue to push the push the edge and 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 really get those rates a little bit higher at this yeah. at this stage in the game without doing any harm. Yeah. So my opinion is they are going to re, re, retain their hawkish rhetoric and they're going to stay the course. And yeah. and I think if the market is betting against that right now, 
you're going to get caught a little wrong footed. And that's why I think that you have to lay into the stock market. I think you're right, mate. And um, I think anyone expecting a major pivot at this stage is is mistaken, in my opinion. But what does a pivot look like? Is it just that they're going to ease back from the pace of hikes? They're not certainly not going to. There's no way in the world they're going to initiate cuts anytime soon. But for me, right, so you've got Jackson Hole next week. Until we get the um, payrolls data um, coming out on the 2nd, of September, and then you've got the CPI numbers coming out on the 13th of September. That is going to make the decision for the FOMC meeting on the on the twenty on the twenty first. At the moment, you've got yeah the market's still sort of toying with more fifty basis points. We're still pricing in a, about forty percent chance of, of seventy five. But there's no reason for for Powell to be anything other than um, vague in the sense he's going to give himself maximum option, optionality at that meeting. Because we'll have to see if there's if they want a softening of the labour market, they want that headline inflation to come down, and maybe it's going to be 50 basis points. But if it's still a really strong payrolls number, if it's if it's another resumption higher in headline inflation, then they go 75 again. So yeah, purposely vague. Yeah, there. well, I I couldn't. I, I'm not going to disagree with you. I 100% agree on that on those points. And speaking of inflation, a headline inflation. Let's turn our attention to the UK inflation. Holy Whoa. crap! We got a double digit number uh today uh, well i say today it's, i guess you're yesterday but anyway uh, double digit 10.1 reading on on cpi i was looking at a chart on cpi that is levels that we haven't seen since the early 80s yeah. is that correct chris yes i think so That's i mean hopefully crazy. you weren't hopefully you weren't saying it breaking through the 200 day moving average and you're going to buy inflation <laughs> but, but it was it's interesting isn't it because the um as as it as it happened, my 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 younger sister called up and she's a nurse and she's like, oh my god, Chris, it's got ten percent inflation. We just I've just got a mortgage coming through. Um, how much higher can it go? And I was like, well, if my sister's talking about this and she's got no interest in finance, then you know this is really impacting um, everyone in the UK. And it's it's also quite a, a good anecdote because yeah, it rained profusely in, in in London yesterday, so much so that yeah, Victoria Station was flooded. It just that happened at a time when yeah, the inflation's coming down. So it's just like this yeah, this tidal wave of, of, of news coming through. But uh, yeah, I mean, what we saw is that we know the Bank of England are expecting inflation, headline inflation to get above 13%. We also saw uh, uh, Citigroup coming out with the call of the day yesterday, that saying that they now expect headline inflation um, in 2023 in Q1 to get above 15%. So the rates market's really repriced. So I'm going to throw it back to you because this is an interesting one. It, rates, it is. And you well, two-year gilt, right, hang on, two seconds. UK gilts were up 25 basis points. Massive move, massive right. outperformance relative to treasuries and, and buns and everything else like this. But yet the pound was weaker. What's going on? That well, that's the problem. Is like the pound it weakened today. And and you could you could you know blame it on broad based dollar strength, but it really was a broad based yeah. dollar strength. So you know I look at the pound and I, I have to believe at this point that the market does not think the Bank of England is going to be able to continue to raise rates at a faster pace or they're going to have to stay steady where they're at at you know half a half a half a percent or or maybe even not because i mean do you tip do you tip the UK into a recession. Well, the word stagflation, they, they, they think that they already told us that they're going to have five quarters of a, The word stagflation is the one you're looking at there. So what you're going to see yeah. is them moving up. And I think that the pound is looking at relative growth dynamics more than the actual relative interest rate settings. So the UK, the Bank the bank of England, who have to obviously manage it by inflation, will continue putting rates up. And we saw quite a big repricing. So we've got 50 basis points now being priced for, for the September meeting, another 50 in the back to that. that we've seen a material move up in the rates curve. But obviously, that's going to impact growth. Now we can say that the you know, Liz Truss can come in and, and do fiscal and support, you know, the, the, the higher inflation costs and, and you know, your, your home payments and bits and pieces. But at the end, I think the the, the 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 FX market with the pound is keying off relative growth dynamics. So you raise rates, the word stagflation kicks in, and that's not supportive of the pound in that situation. So that was a really big one. I think you, you raise a really good point. But we're, you know, if Citigroup's call of fifteen percent inflation comes true. I think the UK is in for a really, really dark ride, to be honest, mate. So uh, you better call back your sister tonight. Yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully she's. Uh, I don't want her to get a fix her mortgage because, yeah, that's a tough one. I think she'll be fixing it at the top. But uh, you know, there's 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 further further to go in this one. Anyway, talking about further to go, have we got further to go in equity markets? Because what we've seen, as I said in the synopsis at the beginning, is we've seen a 19% move up in the S and P, 24% rally in uh, in the Nasdaq. Now, of course, that's come in the back of a lower CPI number in terms of headline. Looks like it's going the right direction. Uh, PPI is going in the right direction. The Fed have moved to a more dynamic stance, shall we say, but they're still putting the, the pedal to the metal. 
but we've seen positioning change. This is a positioning readjustment. You've got options market makers who have gone from a massive short delta uh, gamma position to a long gamma position. So a lot of those hedges, delta hedges they've had, they've closed out. That's obviously pushed the market higher. We've seen realized volatility coming down. So vol control funds have been drip feeding the market. You know, um, pension funds have been underweight equities. They've come to a more neutral setting. CTAs um, have gone from a big short uh, position. Uh, they've now gone to a small long position. The point being is you talk about flow, we've gone from a massive bearish bet in the market to one which is now very neutral, if not slightly positive. It's that positioning readjustment we've seen which has pushed the market higher, in my opinion, Blake. We're now at a make or break, but we've just sold off at the 200-day moving average. We just sold off at, you know, um, all these kind of key levels, the May highs. I'll talk about that in the chart in a minute. So we're at like this, this juncture. How are you reading it now? Well, my, how I'm reading it now is you have to, like I said last week, you have to sell into this rally. And this week really kind of proved that with so many key levels in the S&P right around the 4,300 to 4,350 level where you're talking FIB confluences, a 200-day moving average, channel resistance. There's all sorts of resistance that's overhead right now. And you have to ask yourself, Chris, what's really changed other than positioning? It's yeah. kind of like you know, on the charts, if you look at a chart, I, I've, I've used one indicator literally for the last 25 years, and that's relative strength. Right. And relative strength, you can read it a couple of different ways. There's different ways to actually execute using relative strength. But to me, it's like an oversold RSI reading that's gotten back to neutral, mm -hmm. which means that now the market is neutral, ready to resume. In this case, a downward trend, bearish trend as we go into September and QT gets mm -hmm hiked up. What do you think? Well, just, just on that point of QT, it's interesting because we talked about it last week. Look, the Fed is reducing its balance sheet and, and they'll step it up in September. You make a good point there. But at the moment, what we're seeing is the reserves, um, excess reserves held by, well, which are given to the uh, to the central bank, the, the Fed, by commercial banks, have been actually increasing on the liability side faster than the asset side has been coming down. So that, that's actually excess liquidity um, going into the financial system. Well, the, the way the market sees that is, is basically QE, which is why Bed Bath & Beyond has been doing it's what it's doing, is why crypto has been doing what it's doing. So if that changes, if we see the, if we see, um, li li the liability side uh, moving in the opposite direction, then I think yeah, the equity markets will respond. There's been a very strong correlation between the liability side, excess reserves are held on the liability side of the balance sheet, and the S and P. If that if, if that starts rolling over again, which I suspect it might, um, then I think the equity markets will respond. So don't discount that we have seen better liquidity going through markets, and that's something that we are watching as well. So we're keeping eyes on the uh, the Fed's balance sheet that comes out every Thursday and, and reported on Friday. Okay, and then that's great that you bring up that point because I'm going to actually turn us over to crypto because last week you were talking about the meme stocks and yeah, you know what? How do what, what do we make of that? Crazy week, you, man. <laughs> it, it's been it's been wild, and you know what? I'm looking at crypto, and I have to ask Chris: Is this the end of the? I don't even want to call it a recovery. I mean, if you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin is still trading extremely heavy now. The, the outlier here has been really Ethereum. There's the big talk of the town September 15th, the big merge happens. And the merge is a big deal. I mean, for Ethereum holders, I, I see the reason. You know, you got the proof of stake, you've got the proof of work, you 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 you've got it where the you know Ethereum takes uh what the nine I was gonna say emissions testing. I just took my son's car to get emissions tested yesterday. Right. Uh it's gonna be 99% less for energy consumption, you know, mining Ethereum. That's a big deal, especially in that space. Mm. Um but is it already played out? I mean, everybody's been talking about it. And if you look at like Ethereum, you look at crypto, you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin can't get back above 25,000 on a sustained basis. That was a big breakdown point. Mm -hmm. You look at the total Ethereum uh, uh, the chart, you know, trading view, uh, your partners over at Pepperstone, they have a great chart on, on the total valuation of, of crypto. It's hovering around like 1.2 billion or something, something trillion. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, that, that it can't get its head above that. And I'll tell you, crypto looks like it's about ready to roll over. So, you know, going back to equities, I think this is a space that you need to be following. What, what yeah. do you think about crypto where we're at? Yeah, it's a true risk uh, barometer, isn't it? I think um, like, again, yeah. you come to money supply, you talk about liquidity on the on the Fed's balance sheet, 
Um, again, you know, you've seen uh, as the liability side's pushed up, which makes us think there's better liquidity in market. Crypto's worked really well in that situation. Um, yeah, I'm not even going to talk about the adoption story, and, and I'll leave that to far smarter people like yourself. But uh, yeah, I'd look at it from a from a from a risk perspective. We know it's a momentum asset. We know it's a risk proxy. We know it's a liquidity beneficiary. So I'm watching the, the Fed's balance sheet. I'm looking at the money multipliers M2 and those factors. If that starts rolling over again in the next couple of weeks, then I'd then I'll, I'll 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 say with some conviction that I think we'll probably make a leg lower in in the crypto scene. And and that's kind of what we're seeing again, like we're seeing in the Nasdaq, like we're seeing in the US 500, S and P 500, and and the Russell. Um, yeah, crypto is kind of doing the same thing. We're finding a few supply, a bit of supply coming overhead. Um, so again, it comes down to the situation. If we are going to see the Nasdaq roll over and, and, and really sort of come back into the sort of middle of the channels and various factors, if the Nasdaq's going to drop 5%, then yeah, crypto, Ethereum, Bitcoin, um, yeah, they're going to drop 15%, aren't they? So that's the kind of way I look at the, the situation. So liquidity every day of the week rather than the adoption story there. But uh, yeah, if you can create anything that, that makes the world a better place, then, then I'm all for that. You know, I'm, I'm I'm actually watching Ethereum around that 2,000 mark, and it's struggling at a 38% retracement of its most recent drop, and that's uh that's not a really that's a, that's more of a bearish sign than a bullish sign. So it's something what? that I think if you if you hold cryptos, you need to be keeping an eye. We on. had uh, we had a really interesting comment. I can't remember the gentleman's name now, but uh, in in the comments ring from last week, he was talking about the fact that he felt that we could probably only get to 2,200 at a push. I think that, I can't remember who it was, but uh, whoever it was, you're there and a uh, respectable call there. So keep the comments coming in, keep your views coming in, because if you can you can follow those sort of calls, you're going to generate some alpha coming through in the market. So great to see. Um, and yeah, one to watch. We'll use crypto as our sort of beacon as, as risk proxy going forward. So I like that situation. Anyway, let's go to that's a setup and let's have a look at some of the charts that are on our mind at the moment. I've been banging on about the US 500, S&P 500 here, Blake, and I want to have a, I want to contextualize it. I want to portray exactly what I'm talking about here. So you can see, you know, from that sort of 16th, 17th of June lows, we've had that 19% rally into the 200 day moving average, which is the, the blue line you can see there. Uh, we're just below the, the, the January 4th downtrend, uh, which is also coming in around the 61.8% retracement. We see that black horizontal line there, which is the sort of early May highs, and we just sold off into that. So we've uh, we've been doing well. Yeah, the, the, we have, in my opinion, we haven't had the sell signal yet. I'd like to see that three day crossing below uh, the, the eight day exponential moving average. I know I take your point with the RSI is coming off very extreme levels and moving moving lower. We've seen a stochastic crossover if you follow that side of things. Um, but I just want to see that that moving average crossover just to confirm because it's just held in really well and it's actually defined the trend really well on the way up. So that would be my sort of more systematic approach to, 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 to saying that I now want to take a much more bearish exposure. We're not too far from that point. Uh, you go into a lot of these indices like the IWM, the Russell, they've had these evening star patterns, candle patterns. So yeah, this is a technical chart that, that, that I think everyone's looking at, to be fair. People are making comparisons with an overlay of 2008, aren't they? So the question is, is make or break time? Positioning has been readjusted. Blake, we know you're cool, but what are you seeing there? You know, one of the one of the things that's not on your chart, and I just want to make sure you pointed out, or that we pointed out, if you take the all-time highs of the S&P, you go down to the lows of this year, you you do you do a, just a, a 618 golden fib Fibonacci retracement. It's going to come in right around the 4365 level. I've got roughly, it. I've got it. I've got it there, Blake. I've got it. You can just see it just oh, above. You the, do? The, yeah, I've got it there, mate. Just above the. Uh, I'm, I'm looking. The orange circle. I'm looking. <laughs> well, that's a that's a really important number. It's also 127 percent extension yeah. of the last leg lower. Um, I think that's back in uh, June. So so um, that all comes in right around that 4360, 4370 yep. level. I think that's big resistance for the market. As long as we don't get above 4400, I think you got to continue to stay on the short side. I okay, like it, so Chris. you're shorting. You know how much risk you're taking on because you've got a defined level of stop. That obviously defines your position size in this market. Volatility is lowered, so you can obviously have a slightly bigger position. Obviously, we've got the VIX trading sub 20% at the moment. I think the VIX goes higher personally. If you think uh, equities go low, then you're probably bullish on the VIX in that situation as well. So an interesting chart. There's no doubt in my mind this is the one getting passed around the floors at the moment. There it is. And, and, I, and I'm going to take us over to gold. But I want to say, as traders, we can control two things. One, you can control your risk to a certain extent, obviously, by, via gaps and weekend gaps and things like that. But you can control your finger, trigger finger, too. Don't forget that. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, 
Very nice. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's take a look at gold. And you know, gold really rejected a big resistance, Chris. And um, I'm sorry if you're a gold bug. Look, I I I, I gave it my best. I I, I, I I called silver off the lows when it was down at 18 and change. And you know, I thought gold would follow suit. We we rallied to to 1804, 1803, which is a 618 retracement of the May high down to the you know that spike low back in July, early July which are the same equivalent lows that you saw in 2021 um and that's obviously really critical support but you know i use this analogy it's kind of like a a tennis ball bouncing off a table before it rolls off a table so just imagine that 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 analogy of a ball that's bouncing and the the, the highs are getting lower and it might roll off that table i think we might retest that 1680 level as we came out of an uh, ascending channel um, I'm not bullish on gold, unfortunately, and that makes me more bullish the dollar too. Yeah. So, Chris, what do you think about gold here? Well, I, I was looking at the, uh, the the dollar index, Bloomberg dollar index, is, contains a few more currencies, and that's that's really been very correlated with financial conditions. But I think the dollar is leading financial conditions, so it looks like the dollar's turned up a little bit, and and therefore we may see a bit of a deterioration in, in financial conditions. But what I also look for is is real rates. Now, if you look at ten year real rates, they've gone from effectively uh, effectively eighty seven basis points to two. Uh, now they've pushed back up to about 42 basis points. So if that continues to go higher in that current trajectory, that's going to boost the dollar, that's going to weaken financial conditions, but it's also going to boost or it's going to lower gold. So watching those real rates, they're, they're the key for me because that, that will push up the US dollar, that'll lower equity prices, and I think gold prices go lower. So yeah, watching real rates like the proverbial hawk, and I think that's what gold traders should be looking at as well. But have an open mind. If you're a gold bug, fine. But it, you know, if you're an investor, then that's that's all, all good. But uh, you know, if you're trading it, you know, and it's going down, don't fall in love with position. Is is, is my advice in that situation. Let's go to good that advice. dollar flow and let's have a look at the uh, you know the 57 percent weight of the dollar index, and you can see there the uh, euro dollar. Now we were trading in this in this regression channel. Uh, I've just a regression is similar to a, like a, just a normal channel. It just takes the line of best fit from that high that we saw and and then works two standard deviations. Which in this case, I, I think I've actually pushed it out to about two and a half standard deviations to capture. The, out, the outliers a little bit better, but you can see that it's working well in that situation. And we got um, in you know a couple of a, a week or so ago, we pushed above um, the the regression. It spiked up and, and it's got smacked back down every single time. And it's also co coincided with that that move up into the into into sort of the May June lows, which is Blake's uh, level that he was selling into like a like an absolute wizard. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we've come back lower now. We've it looks like we're in a kind of a bear flag there, aren't we, Blake? And yeah, we're just waiting for for price to crack below that sixty one point eight percent tracement of that recent move up. So that's the line in the sand around 101, just above 101. If we break through there, we're going down to parity, in my opinion. The dollar strengthens and gold prices go lower. We've got through that bag bear flag. It's just consolidating how you're feeling there. Man, you're the man on fire with Euro dollar. Tell us your call. You know, well, first of all, I'm a bear in the Euro and, and I closed out a lot of my positions earlier this week. I sold into rallies already this week and I'm already getting almost up to my normal position size or, 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 or full position size on the short side. But I do want to see a clearing of that 101 level. I think you point that out yeah. marvelously. I think that's really critical support. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I keep going back, Chris, to the idea that, oh my gosh, that, you know, they, you throw so much at the Eurozone and, and the Euro theoretically should be a lot lower, that's but a it's good not. Point. It is a good point. So the Euro natural gas is, the other day up to 250 and Euro is still at 101, just below 102. So yeah, there's a lot of bad news and it's sticking, isn't it? It's, it's absorbing it, it, it well. It is. It is. And, and so, you know, while we're above parity, I, I, I'm still a little nervous, but that doesn't make me bullish either. So mm. I, I'm, I'm going to lean on the, the bear side until... Price tells me I shouldn't, and yeah. I believe while we're below 103.50, yeah. you got to stay The way I look at it is, is there's, there's, for me, there's no reasons to own the euro, but it should be lower. So that's that's the kind of conundrum that we're facing. On, if, uh, for, on, for people who are trading off swing positions, um, you know, it should be much lower, in my opinion, based off real rate differentials, nominal rate differentials, based on the fact that EU natural gas uh, is, 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 is going to continue going, but it's absorbing it really well. So that 101 level, I think, is, is. your defining level. It, and uh, you know it's what what is going to make it go from a, a you know one let's just call it parity to 103 range to 96 cents to 99 cents there's something that there's probably going to be a catalyst out there i just don't know what that is anyway let's move along let's get to iwm you yeah. know i'm going to lean on the bearish side with the iwm and this is an old chart that has been drawn out specifically 
for the people here are at our are at our trade-off community. It's an old chart, but I want to tell you the origins of this chart. That first red box that happened early in or uh, late in 2021, that that false breakout, we were actually filming the pilot of the trade-off. So nobody in the public, none of you guys and gals listening at home saw this chart, but Chris and I actually discussed that false breakout. IWM came crashing down after that once we hit all-time highs right at the beginning of the year. Um, and then if you look at like the end of uh, March, beginning of April, we had another another false breakout. We were supposed to actually talk about this chart, but Tracy Shy Girl, uh, she came on as our guest. So I never got to show this chart, but we had a false breakout back then. You've never let me and go. Almost... You've never forgotten about that, have you? You've just no, because it's <laughs> this, 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 this index is just a glutton for punishment. We actually do, we have another false, possibly false breakout. Failure at the 200-day moving average. Evening star. You pointed out, Chris, a beautiful chart, a uh, candlestick pattern that's evening developing. Star. What is it? Evening star An pattern. Evening yeah. star. So price has made a, it's, a, a made a, it's had a big body, had made a slight high, but bit of indecision, and then we gap lower uh, with 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 price retracing about half a, half a, half of the uh, the previous or the, the the prior day's move sort of thing. He read that like a candlestick expert a little bit earlier today, and so I'll tell you what, IWM, you got to watch it. If we get back below 190. You know, that's a false breakout. Wow, that's going to be a, another catalyst that drives the well, equity mate, if market I, if, floor. What if, do you think? If I was share, I'd be turning back time and I'd be allowing you to to have that chart uh, because it is a good one. And, it, you know, it, it is um, it is something that I think is really interesting there. So this is the the Russell ETF. So it trains on... It trades on the New York Stock Exchange as opposed to, um, you know, on, on the Nasdaq or anything or on, on the, yeah, uh, you know, the, the futures exchange. This is this is on the ETF, um, so it is beholden to New York Stock Exchange hours. But yeah, I think, I think that one looks pretty pretty ropey to be honest. I think when that when that completes that 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 wedge, then I think yeah, shorting opportunities there look pretty good indeed. So anyway, it's that's, a that's probably it's a mid -cap, mid cap index, Chris. It's it's like yeah, you know, kind of like the heartbeat of the uh, of the U.S. equity markets. Well, let's go into yeah. let's go into your heart and let's have a look at what you've got for play of the day. Well, let's uh, let's have a look at my one to start with, uh, Blake, before we go into your heart, as I say there. I've got copper on there for mine today. Uh, and the, what I want to look at is, is, is just this reflection of global risk. Um, and, yeah, while we can look at the dollar, um, if we do see the dollar up, I, yeah, I have no doubt that the copper prices are going up. Now, we've we, we've just broken that uptrend that we've been seeing, um, you know, since July. You can see that low that we had at uh, 358. We're just holding that at the moment. We're just holding on. We're just consolidating. But we're seeing this series of like inside days within that. So I think for me, um, with momentum starting to look like we're going down, we've got the three-day crossing below the eight-day. Um, if we can get though this series of inside days through that 358, I'm short. Uh, I won't have a target on that. I'll just let the market and I continue to follow it until I get out of the trade. But for me now. Um, the signals are that you've got your defined levels. I want to sell weakness, the trigger point for shorts on, on the copper trade there, which may indicate a rising dollar, um, further hires in yields, and uh, you know people looking at you know, deteriorating growth dynamics is, 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 I'm sure, through 358. That's the trigger point for me on copper. All right. Well, well Chris, I'm, I, I love copper, and that's going to scare me a little bit, being an Aussie bull overall. So I'm going to definitely keep an eye on that chart, but I'm going to turn you over to the next chart. Now, uh, we're going to talk about the dollar yen and we're going to talk about turning Japanese. However, if you're if you were born in the 70s, you grew up in the 80s or you could have been born before the 80s. But there's a, a band, an English band called Vapors. the Vapors and they had a they, they, they're the Vapors. Yeah, they had a, a, an album called New Clear Days and they had a great song called Turning Japanese. But for me, I'm actually looking to turn a bull on the Japanese yen. And yep. this is an actual Gartley pattern, Chris. And I'm looking for any move between 136.10 to 137 to be selling into strength. Um, I'm going to take the opposite side of you as far as rates go. I, I think rates, if, if the 10 year starts to turn lower, we see a little bit in the in 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 the 10 year bond market. You know, you look at like boons, they, they're all setting up like these flag patterns that could mm. turn bullish. And if they do and yields turn lower, I'm actually looking for the dollar yen to actually turn with it. So yep. I am looking for, you know, 137, 136.10, and I do not want to see it above 140. 
but yeah. I'm looking to turn Japanese. I'm not, um, I'm, not a, I'm not. I'm not a bond uh, bear by any means. I don't think yields are going up staggeringly. They have gone up, and 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 you know, if, uh, my my thesis is if we were to see real yields moving higher, then then the dollar's something up. So I've got an open mind. I just think it's it's a tough one to call. But you will see. In my opinion, um, if we do see yields lower, that dollar yen trade's going low. So the yen is a play on, on the bond market effectively. If you're bullish the Japanese yen, then you're you're bullish on bonds and you expect yields to converge to J JGBs effectively. So an interesting trade there. And uh, it's good that uh, yeah, you brought that up. So I think that's an interesting one. I guess like, if you're going to be long, if you're going to be short dollar yen, does that make you less bullish on um, the dollar against the euro and, over, and against the pound as well? No, nah, because I think the euro yen could to get and and the and the sterling yen, the pound, the guppy. Remember, we called the guppy, Chris. Yeah. We called the guppy. Right. The guppy's going downstream, just yeah. like we said last week. Well done. Anyway, <laughs> some great calls from the great man, and uh, we'll be back next week for more of the same. Anyway, if you want to just if you want to hit hit the like button, we'd love you. If you stuck around to the end, I'm guessing you do like the show. Uh, if you leave some comments. If you want to leave a comment, we'll answer it and, and then we'll pick out some of the best ones. We'll, we'll try and address those next week and we'll get more on the same. So hopefully see you next week for the trade-off.